وينشر الهدي إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وأوشا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وأوشك اليأس أن يغشى أمانينا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of the Suleiman Ravid Show. Yes, last week we were talking politics. Last week we had uh, MEC4 Transport and Khauteng Ismail Vadi in studio. And the theme of the discussion last week, uh, the topic uh, that was up for discussion was why vote ANC? It was a robust discussion. We had interaction from callers from various parts of the country. Uh, some complimentary, many raising concerns. And that's the nature of incumbency, you know. Uh, the ruling party, the party that's currently uh, in power, the, the person who's currently in power, the person who's currently in office, even in, uh, in lower levels of, of governance, in lower levels of leadership, uh, the person who's currently at the helm of an institution, the person who's currently at the helm of a school or a committee or a board or whatever it may be, uh, there's that pressure of incumbency. You're the one currently uh, taking the responsibility. So you're the one who gets the flag. Uh, those who criticize you, those who are in opposition, uh, those who are the rebels or whatever you want to call them, uh, they are merely highlighting your mistakes, which is a good reflection on them, that they are able to pick up on your mistakes and highlight them and, uh, and uh, emphasize them and amplify them in many ways. But at the end of the day, when they themselves get into office, how much better they can do, it remains to be seen. At times they can, at times it's more or less the same, at times it's worse. However, it is election season, and part of the reason for the discussion, as I mentioned last week, was so that, uh, so that people can conscientize themselves with regards to the issues. The way these things are reported on in the media, unfortunately, uh, it's all about the personalities. It's all about Helen Ziller. It's all about uh, Jacob Zuma. It's all about uh, ANC. It's all about DA marching and this kind of thing. And we saw the chaos earlier in the week. Let me make a quick comment about that chaos. I think it was absolutely a disgrace. Um, I, I saw some of the tweets of, uh, of senior journalists, and I agreed with some of them, where they said, after 20 years of democracy, is this what we get? After 20 years of democracy, is this what we get? The Star newspaper here in Gauteng ran a very interesting uh, caption on its front page. Uh, it brought uh, an editorial piece onto the front page uh, the day after the march, and it said, uh, we do not want uh, banditry in South Africa, we want maturity. We don't want banditry, we want maturity. The DA was, uh, was childish, foolish, and provocative, let's be honest. Uh, this march was not really about, uh, you know, real jobs. This march was about provoking the ANC so that they could, um, you know, uh, get a reaction that uh, they could maximize on, a reaction that they could, uh, you know, go back to the media, go back to the people of South Africa and say, see, we told you, this is a, these are a bunch of, uh, of hooligans. So uh, whilst they, they have a democratic right to march and legally they were permitted to march, uh, everything that's legal and everything that uh, is permissible is not necessarily appropriate. Uh, keeping in mind that there was tension, keeping in mind that it is generally frowned upon uh, for one party to rule, to, to, to march upon the headquarters of another party, even Bantu Holomisa, who's generally very scathing in his criticism of the ANC, even he said the DA should not have marched to the headquarters of the ANC, they should have marched uh, to government buildings. They should have marched uh, uh, to more appropriate uh, venues. So they did an inappropriate thing, even though it was legal. And I know they would argue till the cows come home and they would say, yeah, but in the end of the day, it's our democratic right. And if we allowed the ANC to bully us, then that uh, would have created a precedent. The next time around, they would have bullied us again and they would have bullied others. But that kind of thing doesn't, uh, doesn't really hold much weight when, uh, when, when we have these kind of discussions because you put yourself at risk and you put the reputation of the country at risk. And, and in the end of the day, all that came to the fore was, uh, was a great degree of foolishness and a great degree of childishness. The ANC, on the other hand, whilst it was not uh, appropriate what the DA did, uh, it was not illegal. They could have uh, been a bit more broad-shouldered. That's what those that are the incumbents do. Uh, those who are in power are expected to be a bit more tolerant. They should have let them march. Okay, march, get it over with. Let it be a flesh in the pan. They went and got out their supporters. And then in the end, according to most reporters, uh, most reports, it was their supporters who got rowdy and all hell broke loose. Uh, luckily, there, was no, there were no injuries and, and there were no deaths. But uh, the march had to be called off. And then the DA got what they wanted. They were able to come and say, and you should have heard Helen Zilla after the, the march, 
And the ANC did this and the ANC did that. She didn't say ANC supporters. I mean, she's quite articulate and fluent in English. She carried on just saying ANC, ANC. So it's part of all the electioneering that we would expect now as we get closer to the elections. But it's not a good uh, reflection on, on the country. And uh, not only nationally, it has a negative impact on the psyche of people, but even internationally. I mean, uh, you know, when you looked at some of the reports by Reuters and others, uh, it kind of like created an impression. And I know it's wrong for them to draw these conclusions, but we give international journalists and international news agencies, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity then to create these perceptions in the minds of people that all hell is breaking loose in South Africa after the demise of former President Nelson Mandela. And that kind of like overshadowed uh, the State of the Nation address. What are your thoughts on the State of the Nation address? Did Zuma pull it off or not? Uh, in the end, uh, I suppose going into the speech, everyone thought, it could not be an ordinary speech. It had to be an extraordinary speech. It had to be an extraordinary speech uh, because it was his final uh, State of the Nation address before the end of his first term. And he needed to utilize it as an opportunity uh, to captivate his audience. He's not the most captivating of speakers when he's leading a, a prepared speech. He's very good, much better than Umbeki, very charismatic when he's on the ground and when he's interacting with people and when it's Mshanewam, he almost sings it, by the way, but I'm just using that uh, as an example when it's all informal and more jovial and in a stadium, he's pretty good. But, uh, you know, a kind of setting like parliament, reading off a prepared speech. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? Perhaps you can send us an email or you communicate with us via Twitter. But an interesting week uh, in South African politics and it's, got to, it's going to get more interesting as we go along. And uh, yeah, from time to time, and we'll increase the tempo as we get closer to the elections, we'll be bringing in different role players and we'll be giving you uh, more insight and, and more perspective on, on, on uh, what you need to contemplate on, what you need to chew on in order to be able to make your mind, um, uh, uh, make up your mind in terms of who you want to vote. However, for today, we're taking a break. Today, it's purely Islamiyat, no politics today. We had politics last week. Uh, we had politics of a different kind the week before, live from that uh, Ikhwan al-Muslim conference in Cape Town. And then uh, we had uh, a discussion prior to that uh, on, on Sira, keeping in mind that it was the, the month of Rabiul Awal at that time. Now I want to go back to the normal format, which, will, which I will outline to you in a short while. Uh, and inshallah, this, this week we're dedicating the entire program uh, to Islamic uh, discussions. <laughs> We haven't uh, had these discussions for quite some time. The reason being that, as I said, uh, in the last few weeks, we've been occupied with other discussions. And prior to that, I was on leave. And towards the end of last year, we had a number of discussions with uh, well-known uh, motivational speaker and uh, therapist, Brother Idris Khamisa. So uh, just to remind our viewers with regards to the format, inshallah, whenever we have Islamiyah discussions, this is the format that we follow. Firstly, we'll be starting out with a dua, a supplication taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then uh, today we'll be discussing a dua that he taught uh, to Shaddad bin Aus. And a, a dua, a supplication which he mentioned to the Sahabi is far greater in value than the gold and silver of this world. Then in our second feature, we look at a hadith, uh, prophetic sayings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today we focus about doing for others even though they don't do for, yourself, for you. Do, doing for others, even though they don't do for you. Then we continue with the tafsir of uh, Ayatul Kursi, the greatest verse of the Quran, the verse of the chair as it's known, or the verse of the throne, whatever you want to translate it as. And um, we, we will recap on, on what we discussed in the last discussion, because it's been a while, and then uh, we're going to take a look at the verse, or the sentence in that verse which pertains to uh, intercession. Then we move on to the seerah feature, and we were previously discussing the great qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's grandfather. That's the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's grandfather. We will continue that discussion. And then we'll wrap up uh, with our marriage tip for the week. Today, a very interesting one. Uh, you know, and it's entitled, That's All Men Think About. That's All Men Think About. Obviously, it's, uh, it's of an intimate nature. It's of a sexual nature. But uh, it may bring, the title may bring a, a, a smile to many people's lips. But in the end of the day, it's a very important point, uh, a very, very important point. It can make your marriage, and in many instances, it can break your marriage. Granted, it's not that uh, over which your entire marriage should be based, but uh, it can make or it can break your marriage. So that's the lineup uh, for the program. Uh, throughout the program, you'll see the Twitter handle, the Facebook uh, page, uh, details. 
as well as the email address uh, appear on your screen. Please feel free to communicate with us and, and give us feedback. We really appreciate it. And it gives us an indication as to how the program is uh, coming across to the viewers out there. So when we come back uh, from the break, inshallah, we move on to our dua segment, the first discussion for this evening. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, as I mentioned, we commence uh, this evening's uh, program and discussions with a supplication, a dua uh, taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a prayer taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This prayer was captured, memorized, and narrated by the Sahabi and companion, Shaddad bin Aus radiallahu an, and it's recorded in the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah. So, uh, Tirmidhi is a compilation of a hadith, a compilation of prophetic uh, sayings. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Shaddad bin Aus radiallahu an, that when you see people collecting gold and silver treasures, when you see people collecting gold and silver treasures, then consider this prayer and consider this dua and consider this supplication as your treasure. Meaning that it's far greater in value than the material possessions of this world. And it's also a dua that the Prophet wasallam used to recite in the, in the last uh, qa'da, in the last sitting of a four akats of salah. When you're performing four units of prayer, in the last sitting before you terminate with the, with the salam and the greeting, the Prophet wasallam used to recite this dua. It's a uh, dua that covers many aspects. I'm going to go through the Arabic and then the entire translation, and then we'll elaborate on it bit by bit. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr, wa as'aluka azimat al rushd, wa as'aluka shukra ni'matik, wa husna ibadatik, wa as'aluka lisanan sadiqa, wa qalban salima, wa khuluqan mustaqima, wa a'udhu bika min sharri ma ta'lam, wa as'aluka min khayri ma ta'lam, wa astaghfiruka mimma ta'lam. Oh Allah, I beg you for steadfastness in religious affairs. I beg, me, I, I, beg, I beg you for determination to follow the guidance. I beg you to enable me to show gratitude for your bounties and worship. And I beg you to allow me to worship you with the best of devotion. I beg you for a truthful tongue, a sound heart, an upright character. I seek your protection from the evil of all that only you are aware of. And I beg you for the good that only you know. And I seek forgiveness from you for what you know of my sins. Surely you are the all-knowing uh, of all the hidden. Surely you are the all-knowing of all the hidden. Now that's the translation of the entire prayer, the entire dua, the entire supplication. Now we'll take it sentence by sentence. The first sentence we are requesting, Almighty Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr. Oh Allah, I beg you for steadfastness in religious affairs. You see, one is to know what is good, the other is to do good occasionally, and the third is to remain steadfast, to remain consistent, to remain perpetual, to remain firm on doing good. In, uh, in Surah Hud, one of the chapters of the Quran, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala instructs the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا umirta that remain steadfast as you have been commanded to remain steadfast. And it was this command that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started to have gray hair and he was, uh, he was questioned that, you know, are you, are you aging? He said, yes, uh, this, this, in, this surah, this chapter has made me age. And scholars say that it was this, this instruction in this chapter that had caused Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to age. In other words, remaining steadfast is difficult, but remaining steadfast is what is required. That's why in one verse, Allah Taala says, "Inna ladina qalu rabbun Allah." Those who say Allah is our Rabb, meaning they have belief as they ought to have belief. Thumma staqamu. Then they remain steadfast on the dictates of that belief. They remain steadfast in upholding the commands of Allah, abstaining from the prohibitions of Allah, being compliant to the teachings of Allah. Then they will get the rewards promised by Allah. So Islam. It's not only about believing and occasionally practicing. Islam is about consistently practicing. So that's the first request. Oh Allah, I beg you for steadfastness in religious affairs. The second re request, wa as'aluka azimat al rushd. I beg you, uh, I, I beg you for determination to follow the guidance. Many people were exposed to guidance. The mushrikeen of Makkah were exposed to guidance. Quran was being revealed in their midst. The Prophet ﷺ came from amongst them. He was one of them. 
uh, the people of the book in Medina, they were exposed to guidance, but they had created a number of obstacles, you know, their jealousy, their pride, their reluctance to give up that which they had unlawfully earned. All of that had become obstacles between them and guidance. So we sing, oh Allah, we, we beg you to give us that determination to follow the guidance because the guidance is there. But if I don't have the determination, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to, to, to muster up the courage and to boost my willpower and, and uh, take benefit from that guidance and follow that guidance. وَأَسْأَلُكَ the third, uh, the, third, uh, the third request. وَأَسْأَلُكَ شُكْرَ نِعْمَتِكَ I, I beg you to enable me to show gratitude for your bounties. The bounties of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala upon us are manifold and multifold. The bounties of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala upon us are innumerable, countless. We cannot, uh, we cannot even understand many of the bounties of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. But we need to show gratitude. How? By utilizing the bounties of Allah to please Allah and not utilize the bounties of Allah to displease Allah. Then the fourth request, وَحُسْنَ عِبَادَتِكْ And I beg you to enable me to worship you with the best devotion. One thing is to worship and the other is to worship in a good way, in the best way. Let's take Salah for example. You perform Salah. Some people perform Salah because they have to. Some perform Salah merely to discharge the obligation. And then you get those who perform Salah in a very beautiful way. When you look at them performing their Salah, you just observe them performing their Salah. And then you think to yourself, wow, look at the tranquility, look at the focus, the concentration, the devotion, the love that the person has when they're performing Salah. You're not, you're not privy to what they're saying in their prayer, but you just look at the actions and all of this shines through and it reflects. Then, وَأَسْأَلُكَ لِسَانًا صَادِقًا Oh Allah, I ask you for a truthful tongue, a truthful tongue. A liar is a person who's detested by Allah. Allah has cursed the liars in the Quran. So we say, Wallah, let only the truth flow from my tongue. And then, وَقَلْبًا salima, A sound heart. Let my heart be fixed on the sirat al mustaqim Let my heart be free of all spiritual ailments of jealousy, hatred, malice, animosity, greed, all of those kind of, uh, of spiritual diseases and maladies. وَخُلُقًا مُسْتَقِيمًا Oh Allah, grant me upright character. People have knowledge these days, they have wealth, they have status, they have profile, they have power, but very few have that sublime conduct and that great character. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا تَعْلَمْ Oh Allah, I seek your protection from all evil that you know. I can seek protection from the evil that I know by listing it, but there are many evils that I'm not aware of. You are aware of because your knowledge is all encompassing. You are aware of all evils. So I, I would just cut a long story short of Allah and say, all evil that you are aware of, which in reality is all evil that is in existence, I seek your protection from it. And I ask you of all the good that you are aware of. If I'm going to start asking for specifics, it will be restricted to what I know, and then further restricted to what I can remember, and then further restricted to what is priority in my mind, in terms of what I think is good for me. But you know all, that is, all good that is in existence, and you know what I know. You know what I need more than I know what I need, so I ask you for all goodness. And then, وَأَسْتَغْفِرُكَ مِمَّا تَعْلَمْ And I seek forgiveness from all the sins that I've committed, which you know. There are many sins that I'm not even aware of. Many times I didn't even realize that I was sinning. Many times I sinned and I forgot. Many times I sinned and I didn't realize. Allah, you are aware of all of it. Forgive all of it. Surely you are the knowing of all of the unseen. You are the knowing of all of the unseen. So this was a dua taught to Shaddad bin Aws radiallahu anhu, the great Sahabi by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'll just go through the, the Arabic once again because there's such beauty in the Arabic language and there's such barakah in the actual words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr wa as'aluka azimata al-rushd wa as'aluka shukra ni'matik wa husna ibadatik wa as'aluka lisanan sadiqa wa qalban salima wa khuluqan mustaqima wa a'udhu bika min sharri ma ta'lam wa as'aluka min khayri ma ta'lam wa astaghfiruka mimma ta'lam innaka anta allamu al-ghuyub ameen ya rabbal alameen wa awshaka al-yasu an yagsha amanina Welcome back. We now move on to our second discussion for this evening, and that is our hadith discussion. The first hadith that I want to discuss this evening is a hadith from Tabarani. And the theme, as I mentioned early on, is about doing for others, even though they don't do for you. But this is a beautiful hadith because it talks about uh, the day of Qiyamah, in a sense. And it also talks about uh, certain qualities of, of great people before it comes to the actual theme that... Uh, that we are focusing on this evening. 
the, the Arabic reads as follows, and Thawban radiyallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna hawdi ma bayna adana ila amman, akwabuhu adadun nujum, ma'uhu ashaddu bayadam min al-thalj wa ahla min al-asal, awwalu man yariduhu fuqara'u al-muhajirin, qulna ya Rasulullah, sifhum lana, qala shu'thu al-ru'us, dunsu al-thiyab, الذين لا ينكحون المتنعمات ولا تفتح لهم السدد الذين يعطون ما عليهم ولا يعطون ما لهم رواه الطبراني The English translation Thawban رضي الله عنه writes that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said my pond meaning that pond that will be granted to the Prophet of Allah on the day of Qiyamah from which there will be water coming forth and his, his ummah he, the people of his nation who believed and who practiced will come and will drink from that water and quench their thirst on a day of great thirst, the day of resurrection. And some will be so privileged that the Prophet ﷺ will feed them with his own blessed hands. So the Prophet of Allah says, in the hawdi, that this pond of mines, which will, you know, which will feature on the day of resurrection, ma bayna adana ila amman, it stretches from Aden to Amman. Now we know these are two cities and it does not mean that uh, the distance of the Hawd and, or the length of the Hawd and the pond, uh, this is obviously in reference to the pond of Kothar, uh, as it is commonly referred to. It doesn't mean that it is exactly the distance between uh, Adan and Amman. No, it means that it's a very long distance. This was used uh, to explain to the Sahaba that it will be very long. It will be a very big pond. And then, Akwabuhu Adadun Nujum. Its bowls are equivalent to the stars in the sky. When you look up in the sky, there's millions of stars everywhere. So the bowls and the cups from which people will take water from the spawn to drink will be millions because there'll be millions who will be drinking. Then, uh, The water is whiter than snow. The water of the spawn is whiter than snow. And it is sweeter than honey. So it's a big pond, a lot of cups, goblets, whatever you want to call it. Whiter than snow water, sweeter than honey water. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, The first people who will come to this pond and who will take benefit and drink from this pond are the poor emigrants. The poor emigrants, the muhajireen who were poor. So the, the sahaba, the companion said, Sifhum lana ya Rasulullah. Describe them to us, O the Prophet of Allah, so we can understand that what are their remarkable qualities, and then we can also follow in their footsteps in the hope that we will also be privileged and, and honored like them. So the Prophet started to give their description. He said, Shu'thu ru'us, their, their hair is disheveled. Dunsu uh, thiyab, their clothes are not the most attractive. Alladheena la yankihoon al mutana'imat. They are not the ones who, are, who, who, who get the, the most beautiful uh, of women in, in marriage or the women who come from the upper class. No. sudad. For them, doors are not opened. For them, doors are not opened. They fulfill the rights of others. Even though others don't fulfill their rights. And it, it's this last sentence that features uh, in our theme. So the Prophet ﷺ talks about one of the great bounties that believers, true believers, will receive on the day of Qiyamah, and that is the bounty of being, uh, being given to drink from the Hawda Kothar, from the pond of Kothar. And then he said, the first people to arrive there, the first people to be privileged with this honor will be the poor emigrants, Fuqara'ul Muhajireen. And when Sahaba said, to describe them, who will they be, Ya Rasulullah? He said, their hair will be disheveled. Not that Islam says you must be untidy, but because they are so poor, and the nature of the work that they will have to do. They are not those people who are prim and pop, uh, proper, who have the, who have the financial uh, ability to be in such a state where their clothes are spotless, etc. These people have to do the kind of work and, and they have to live the kind of life where they are not in the position to, 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 uh, to come across as, as uh, presentable. They are not, they, because now they are you know, considered to be uh, those who are not so... Uh, pleasant in the appearance, etc. They're not going to get, uh, you know, women who grow up in, in luxury or living in luxury as, as their wives. People don't open doors for them. Important people, people open doors for them. Come in, sir. Come in, sir. No, these people are not considered to be important in society. But they had one great quality amongst many other qualities that has, uh, that has elevated them to the status that they will be the first people arriving at the house of And what is this quality? الَّذِينَ يُعْتُونَ مَا عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يُعْتُونَ مَا لَهُمْ they do for others, even though others don't do for them. They do for others, 
even though others don't do for them. And this is something that, uh, that we, we really need to keep in mind. That in life, you cannot, you cannot have this philosophy that I'll only do for somebody if they do for me. Or I'll do for you proportionate to the extent that you do for me. No, no, no. That is not what Islam teaches us. Islam says you do for others for the pleasure of Allah. If they appreciate, well and good. If they don't appreciate, Allah appreciates. And if they do for you, well and good. But if they don't do for you, your intention was not to get something in return or not to show gratitude for something that they did. Your intention was solely for the pleasure of Allah. And that's the crux of it. The next hadith I want to discuss is a hadith of Tirmidhi along a similar theme. And Hudayfata radiyallahu an qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la takunu imma'atan taqulun in ahsana nas ahsanna wa in zalamu zalamna walakin wattinu anfusakum in ahsana nas an tuhsinu wa in asa'u fala tadlimu rawahu Tirmidhi. Hudayfa radiyallahu an narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that do not imitate other people. Do not, do not subscribe to that concept of reciprocity. That you know what? If they treat me well, I'll treat them well. No, 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 no. Don't follow that philosophy in life. Rather, accustom yourself to doing good to those who do, did good to you and not doing wrong to those who wronged you. Do good to those who do, 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 uh, did good to, for you. Your intention should not only be to do good when others do good, but if others have done good to you, then return the favor with the favor. Allah says in the Quran, al jazaul ihsan illa al-ihsan. Uh, you know, goodness should, should prompt goodness. And those who have been evil to you, that should not prompt, uh, prompt evil. No, because you should be a person from whom only goodness comes forth. So in a nutshell, what we learn from this hadith discussion is that uh, do for others for the sake of Allah and don't expect anything in return. And if people do good for you as a sign of appreciation to Allah and to them, do good for them. But if they do wrong to you, then uh, bear that patiently, bear, bear that tolerantly, Ask Allah wa ta'ala to forgive them and guide them, but do not reciprocate. Do not return evil with evil. Do not uh, let uh, an evil action prompt another evil action. What a great lesson in, in good character. And what a good, great lesson in, uh, in strengthening the social fabric. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. <laughs>《Welcome back. We now move on to our third segment for this evening, and this is where we have the tafsir discussion, where we take a look at uh, the commentary of verses from the quran -i -Kareem. And we have been discussing in the past Ayatul Kursi, the greatest verse of the Qur'an. We discussed the many benefits of this verse. Uh, we discussed different ahadith which talk to us about the merits of reciting this verse after every one of the compulsory uh, prayers, after every one of the farad salah, and um, the great benefit uh, in terms of how this, uh, this verse, if recited, uh, it protects a person from all types of, uh, of, of difficulties, hardship, and calamities, etc. Now, we were, we were discussing sentence by sentence, and in our last discussion, we discussed the sentence, Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi ard This verse begins by praising Allah wa ta'ala, that Allah la ilaha illa hu, Allah is that being besides whom there is none worthy of worship. al uh, al qayyum and uh, we discussed the verse that Allah wa ta'ala is the one who is ever living and he is the maintainer. He maintains everything that he has created. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Neither slumber nor sleep overcomes him. Then the last sentence we discussed. له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض Everything that exists in the heavens and everything that exists in the, in the, in the earth uh, belongs to him. And to him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. Meaning Everything that exists in the heavens and the earth and everything that exists full stop has been created by Allah and is being sustained by Allah, is in the control of Allah, is playing out and existing as per the instruction, the wish and the command of Allah. Everything and everyone, irrespective of how powerful, irrespective of uh, what unique features or qualities they may have, in kullu man fis samawati wal ardi, Allah says in, in, in Surah Taha that all of his slaves, no matter who they are or what they are or what they have been granted or how powerful they are, when they come to Allah, they come as servants, they come as slaves because everything belongs to Allah. Everything is in the ownership of Allah. This entire human being with his mental capacity and emotional capacity and, and physical capacity and wealth and everything belongs to Allah. And uh, therefore, our wealth is not ours. We have superficial custodianship. The day we die, it goes on to others as per the instruction of Allah. This body is not ours. It has been granted to us as a trust by Allah. And hence the body is treated 
after demise and during life as per the instruction of Allah. Everything belongs to Allah. Lahu, the lam year in Arabic denotes ownership. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi ard. So that's the sentence of Ayatul Kursi that we discussed the last time. Now, we move on to the next sentence. Man dalladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'idhni. Allah says, who is there that can intercede by him save with his permission? Who is there that can intercede by him save with his permission? Put it in other words, no one can intercede by Allah except with the permission of Allah. No one can intercede by Allah except with the permission of Allah. The mushrikeen, the polytheists, they had this Iranian belief that nah, we can live our lives how we want. Uh, this idol will intercede for us or that deity will intercede for us and uh, we will be forgiven. Now, Islam is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a neither of two extremes. Islam does not say that Allah is subjugated by someone's intercession. That if uh, some, you know, make-believe deity comes and intercedes, Allah has waliyadu billah. Allah has no discretion and he'll have to accept the intercession. On the other hand, we don't go to the other extreme and say there's no such thing as intercession. What Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, مَنْ ذَلَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ That yes, there will be intercession, but only those who have been granted permission by Allah to intercede will be able to intercede. And they'll only be able to intercede on behalf of those for whom they've been granted permission to intercede. And then it's still at the discretion of Allah if he wants to accept the intercession. No doubt you will accept in, in the most instances, but it's totally in his discretion, his power. So you have to focus on pleasing Allah. You cannot focus on pleasing anyone else because they don't have absolute discretion. We know on the day of Qiyamah, there's a famous narration that people will be in a state of fright, knowing now that reckoning will take place. And they'll run from prophet to prophet saying that, uh, please intercede on behalf of all of us. We can't take uh, the, the, the rigors of this day and, and, and the difficulties of this day. Let, let, the, let the reckoning begin. And every Nabi will say, you know what, I, I consider myself not to be in the best position. I, I, you know, there were one or two times in my life when I don't think I did the most appropriate of things. So nafsi, nafsi, I'm worried about my own position. Where am I going to intercede on your behalf? Until they come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah wa ta'ala will say, Ya Muhammad, irfa' ra'asak, washfa' to shafa' That, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, raise your head and ask and you'll be granted. Intercede and your intercession will be accepted. And the, the, the detailed narration is, uh, is known. But the point that is emphasized is that Allah wa will grant permission to Rasulullah to intercede. Even the Prophet of Allah does not have absolute discretion in this regard. He can only intercede if Allah allows him to intercede. And he can only intercede for those on whose behalf Allah allows him to intercede. Allah himself says in the Quran, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَرَضِيَ لَهُ قَوْلًا only those people will be able to intercede on the day of Qiyamah to whom Allah has granted permission. Even the angels, forget human beings. Allah Taala mentions in Surah Anbiya, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنِ ارْتَضَى Allah Taala says, when it comes to the angels, he knows what is before them and what is behind them and only the one with whom he is pleased will be able to intercede. Only the one with whom Allah is pleased and Allah has given that angel permission, will that angel be able to, uh, to intercede? In, in Surah Al-Najm, Allah Taala says, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَلَكٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْضَى There are so many angels in the heavens and earth. Their intercession can be of no benefit to anyone except when the permission of Allah is granted and when Allah is happy. So the lessons we learn from here, yes, we should do things which will increase the likelihood of us securing intercession. Securing the intercession of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, securing the intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam, securing the intercession of the angels, securing the intercession of pious people. We know even the Hafid will intercede on behalf of people in his family who are destined for Jahannam. But we have to understand that our deeds have to be done with the intention of pleasing Allah. Our deeds have to be done with the intention of pleasing Allah because even those who have, uh, who, are, who will intercede, they can only intercede with the permission of Allah. Allah forbid if Allah says, this person, you are not allowed to intercede on his behalf, they have no discretion thereafter. So focus on doing those deeds which are pleasing to Allah Taala. By his grace, Allah will grant people the permission to intercede for you which will further be of assistance to you on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah grant us the understanding.
Welcome back. We now move on to our Sira feature. And this is where we discuss the life story of the greatest personality ever to grace planet Earth. And that is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, for a number of months, we have been discussing the ancestry of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brief profiles of his different ancestors. And our last discussion revolved around the, 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 the life story of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And remarkable qualities that he had. He was a leader in the, in the, in the Quraysh. How his life started uh, very differently. His father Hashim was on his way uh, traveling to the Sham region and uh, he stopped over in Medina and married this woman uh, who, who, who he was captivated by. She fell pregnant. He continued with the journey, but he never returned. He passed away and he was buried in Gaza. And Abdul Muttalib grew up as an orphan. And years later, his uncle came and picked him up. And he was so, uh, you know, shabby and he was so. Uh, you know, uh, simple in his dress because he was often when he was coming into Mecca that people asked his uncle Muttalib that who is this? And at that, in that condition, he was, he was shy to say, this is my nephew. So he said, this is my slave. This is a slave. And that's how he got the name Abdul Muttalib. And later on then, obviously, he started living with his uh, paternal family and he grew up to be a custodian of the Kaaba and, uh, you know, to be a man of remarkable qualities. His father Hashim was a man of remarkable qualities, but he outshone his father as well, how he was even prepared to sacrifice his own son uh, to fulfill a vow that he made to Allah. How it was at his hand that the well of Zamzam, that famous well, was rediscovered. How it was mentioned, and this is where we, we terminated the last time, whenever there would be severe drought, the people of Makkah would take him to the top of mountain and beseech Allah, uh, in his name, how, uh, you know, the, 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 his people at that time were very brutal and, and very backward and, and, and very pagan in, in, in their approach to life. But he stood out. He, for example, forbade marriage between those who were, who were, who were closely married, like uh, closely related, like marrying your own sister or your own aunt. He would abstain from adultery. He would abstain from intoxicants. He would abstain from burying daughters alive. He would abstain from making tawaf, succumbulating the Kaaba naked. Uh, actually, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah has said, many of the things that Abdul Muttalib had abstained from, the Quran came and then uh, emphasized them as prohibitions. Many of the rulings of Abdul Muttalib were upheld by, by the Quran. And as we discuss the profiles of each one of the ancestors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we can see that as it's coming closer to the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the profile of each of his ancestors uh, is, is getting better in terms of good character, etiquette, blessings, uh, spiritual, spirituality and, and miraculous feet. And, and we saw this particularly in Abdul Muttalib. The life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's father Abdullah was very short. And the Prophet sallallahu did not even uh, see his father. His father was uh, passed away before he, he was born. Now there are a few narrations which I want to make uh, mention of uh, this evening uh, just to, to wrap up this discussion on, on the, the specialities and the good qualities of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu There's a narration of Sahih Muslim when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said that Allah has preferred Banu Kinana from the children of Ismail. We know the Prophet ﷺ came from the progeny of the Prophet Ismail. Uh, and he was obviously the son of Ibrahim. Abraham, we explained this in detail in our previous discussions. So from that, the progeny of Ismail ﷺ, there were different branches. Allah preferred Banu Kinana from the children of Ismail. And from Banu Kinana, he, he preferred the branch Quraysh. And from the Quraysh, he then preferred the branch Banu Hashim. And from the Banu Hashim, he preferred me. This is, this is the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And in another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah preferred Banu Hashim, from Banu Hashim, Abdul Muttalib, and from Abdul Muttalib's progeny, he preferred me. So Abdul Muttalib has been specifically mentioned in one narration. Then in another narration, uh, it, is, uh, it is mentioned uh, with regards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acknowledging his, uh, his, his grandfather. It's, it is mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the angel Jibreel, Gabriel, said, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam says, I have poured over every e region of the earth from east to west, but I have not come across a family more noble and gracious than that of Banu Hashim. I have not come across a family more noble and gracious than that of Banu Hashim. And Abdul Muttalib was the son of, of Hashim. And in another narration in Tirmidhi, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam mentions that I, I travel the earth in search of uncontaminated souls. But since it was an ignorant, it was an era of spiritual ignorance. People were in spiritual ignorance. So, you know, the standard had to be somewhat different. So I, I did not look at, uh, I did not search for outward actions. I did not see who was, 
you know, outwardly, you know, good and obedient because it was an era of spiritual ignorance. But I focused on disposition and aptitude. I looked at internal qualities. And in this aspect, after traveling the length and breadth of the earth, I did not find anyone better than the Arabs in general and the Banu Hashim in particular. I did not find anyone better than the Arabs in general and the Banu Hashim in particular. And that's why Rasulullah came from this progeny of the Arabs and particularly the Banu Hashim and more particularly Abdul Muttalib's progeny. Now from next week, inshallah, we'll continue the discussion talking about Rasulullah Wasallam's father and then taking on the discussion further in, term of, in terms of the life of Rasulullah Wasallam. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Welcome back. We now move on to our final segment, and that is our marital tip for the week. And today I've entitled the discussion, Men Only Want One Thing. Men Only Want One Thing. And all married women and many unmarried women out there will know what I'm referring to. Now, it may bring a, a, a smile to the lips of many women. It may bring a big smile to the lips of many men that, yes, well, now let's have this discussion. And from the onset, I want to say, let's not get all sexist about it. I know men also have to give, uh, receive some guidelines when it comes to matters uh, pertaining to the bedroom and matters pertaining to intimacy. But we can't all the time simultaneously address both men and women. And there are certain deficiencies which are found to a greater extent in men. And there are other deficiencies which are found to a greater extent in women. This is not being sexist or chauvinist. This is just reality. Uh, in the end of the day, both men and women have to, agree, uh, have to address their deficiencies in order to be able to enhance their marriages. But many times we get caught up in the side debate. Now, if you're telling me, then tell my husband. If you're telling my wife, then tell me. Uh, if you're telling my husband, then uh, if you're telling me, then tell my wife also. Let us understand that if you change, in all likelihood, you're going to prompt your spouse to change. But if you're going to wait for your spouse to change, then perhaps nothing will change. And if you are the first to change, you'll get the greater reward in the court of Almighty Allah. Wa ta'ala. Now, in a nutshell, we know what, what this is all about. Men have a tendency uh, to want intimacy more frequently. Generally, men want it more frequently. Although it is mentioned in the hadith that the, 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 the urge of a woman perhaps is more intense. But the urge of a man is more frequent. And women are not all that uh, comfortable with frequency. They perhaps look more at intensity. And, and, and quality, but men are a bit more, uh, you know, occupied with frequency. They, they require intimacy at, at a greater frequency. Now, what happens is women sometimes tend to get very defensive and they say, well, this is all that a man wants. You only see this in me. You're only interested in my body. Is this, our, this, is this all what our marriage is about? So, so what if it's been two weeks? So, so what if it's been three weeks? You know, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you huddle, uh, cuddle me and, and hug me? Uh, why don't you take me shopping? Uh, you know, why don't you show interest in my hobbies? Uh, and uh, yes, all of that is important. The husband obviously cannot enter into a marriage with only one, uh, you know, intention. And he cannot, uh, he cannot think that marriage is only about one thing. It's not only about that, but that plays a fundamental role. It plays a fundamental role. That's the reality. That's the reality. And Islam itself has, underst has, has, um, has uh, uh, understood this and explained this to us. Ya ma'ashar al-shabab. When Nabi Sallallahu was encouraging the youngsters to get married if they had the means, why? When you're fulfilling your urges in a legitimate way, it's easier to control your gaze. And it's more uh, easier for you to protect your chastity. So by mentioning these reasons, it's already an indication from the side of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi that sexual satisfaction is one of the great objectives of marriage. Sexual satisfaction is one of the great ob objectives of marriage. Not the only objective of marriage. Yes, marriage has got to do with love and companionship, peace and tranquility. And there are different times for different things. At times, a wife might be ill. At times, as you grow older, things change. The Quran also says that in the earlier part of the life, it's, it's, it's more about passion. In the latter part of the life, it's, uh, it's more about uh, mercy. It's more about, uh, you know, gratitude to each other. But women need to come out of this mindset. You need to understand that one of the fundamental pillars in, in terms of your quest to keep your husband married, uh, to keep your husband happy, is to keep him sexually satisfied. To keep him sexually satisfied. Many women fall into this, uh, into this bad routine. Once the children start coming, some women have to work. Then you're constantly tired. Uh, you constantly have excuses. You conveniently have headaches. Uh, I'm not saying that at times when this is justified, 
Sometimes you may genuinely have a headache. Sometimes you may genuinely not be in the mood. Sometimes you may genuinely, you know, have had a long, uh, long day. Understood. But when this becomes the norm rather than the exception, when it becomes the norm rather than the exception. And I read, I read a beautiful piece where a woman encourages her fellow sisters and says, my sisters, let's keep our men to ourselves. Now, you know, here we can get all technical. We can say, yeah, well, I can give, uh, I can give it to him 10 times a day. But in the end of the day, he'll still go look at another woman. Remember something, if a glass is overflowing, then you can't put more in it, isn't it? So there's not, it's, it's, we're not for a moment saying that if you keep your husband sexually satisfied, that he'll never stray. But Islam itself says that marriage by its very definition decreases the likelihood of, uh, of adultery. And keeping your husband sexually satisfied will not eradicate the possibility in totality, but will decrease the likelihood. And wouldn't you want to decrease the chances now, again, we're not saying that intimacy is not only about you, do, do, uh, you know, being intimate for the sake of, uh, of, of trying to uh, decrease the chances of your husband straying. But there are certain realities. There are certain realities. I mean, in the end of the day, you can have the best husband in the, in the world. But human beings have urges, right? Let me give you an example of food. Don't give him breakfast. Don't give him lunch. Don't give him supper. Skip breakfast the next day. Skip lunch the next day again. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? That husband who's no normally very cool, very calm, very jovial, is he still going to be cool, calm and jovial when he's in your home? That his urge is going to drive him somewhere else? Now, doesn't, that doesn't justify him indulging in haram. I'm not in any way saying it's justified for men. It's not. If you have a problem, you have to address the problem. And there are various options, halal options at your disposal if there, if there is a problem. But we also need to understand certain realities. What draws many men uh, towards this? There are, again, those men who may be drawn for other reasons. But primarily, you're living in an era where the man is, is working in an environment uh, where, where temptation is, is you know, superimposed. Now, again, I'm saying that let's not become uh, tit for tat in this. Men also have to keep their women satisfied. They also have to ensure that uh, you know, they, they, they are prim and proper and, and, and clean and neat and attractive for their women. But today we're discussing it from the one perspective and emphasizing it from that perspective. On other occasions, we'll, we'll, def, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it from the other perspective. And in this piece, which I read, this woman says to her sisters, that does he always have to ask, when was the last time that you sent him an SMS? You know, making suggestive remarks about what he's enjoying when he come, when he will, what he's likely to enjoy when he will come home. In the end of the day, why must he always ask? Why can't you sometimes do it when you are in the mood? And sometimes even if you're not in the mood, put yourself in the mood for the sake of, of your husband. Overcome your own little personal preferences for the sake of your husband. And many times you may think, yeah, well, okay, he wants me to do this for him. But you know, a lot of things that I prefer and I want is not doing for me. But somebody's got to take the first step. And she writes to her sisters and she says, my own experience has shown that many times when I, I, when I took this decision, that I'm going to now keep my husband happy in the bedroom as far as possible, give him that special treat within the parameters of the Sharia every now and again. Then I saw automatically that prompted him to bring the flowers and the chocolates and to take me out for a meal. And now he was less angry and less tense. So women out there, keep your man to yourself. He's your man, keep him happy. And if you keep him happy, then the chances of him looking for happiness elsewhere is, uh, is, is very slim or much slimmer. Not, not impossible, but much slimmer. Keep him satiated and then he won't want to look for satiation elsewhere. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Well, that brings us to the end of this evening's edition of the Sulaiman Ravid Show. Until we meet again, fi manillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> نبي على الفكرة الأحرار في زمن أضحى به الحق بالقلة